like Steve and thanks Dave and Steve and Dave are, are gentlemen that I have uh, grown up with, known them for many, many years and decades. It's a pleasure to, you know, to, to be doing this with them and also to see all of you. Um, <clears throat> I'm here to present an award um, for this year, um, but I know we have um, here at least one, and I could be missing others, uh, the prior award winners. Uh, as Dave said, there are eight, eight um, winners here, um, eight winners, eight awards overall, um, and so I'm just going to set the scene a little bit. Um, maybe I'll start at the beginning, which was a long time ago, and I don't remember the date, but Michael Melge, um, uh won the first Gordon Award for an, a study of the San Francisco waterfront taken from an 1872 series of newspaper articles, and it was quite a, quite a colorful piece. And then the next award went to Bob Barty, who's, who's here, um, and uh, he did a, a, a very nice work called The Life and Death of the China Mail, and which was a well-researched and written account of um, a steamship company owned by Chinese investors in San Francisco from 1915 to 1925. And it was a very interesting study in, in the interplay between the Chinese community and the, and the community otherwise in, in, in California. Um, the award um, after that went to Tom Layton, and it was for the voyage of the frog. And this was a book length examination um, um, and re kind of recreation of a, of a wreck that was discovered in the harbor of Mendocino underwater. And artifacts were found. There were amateur. amateur um, marine archaeologists who were, if you can call them that, others would call them bandits, <laughs> who, who were digging up the, um, or unearthing or exhuming from the water um, artifacts, but then a full-fledged study went underway, and, uh, and Tom Layton had a lot to do with that in terms of making it a proper historical archaeological undersea study. And he wrote a book reconstructing the, um, the, the archaeology and the voyage of the frolic in, in the historical times by the wreck. Um, there was um, the next one was by a fellow called James Stone. It was My Dad the Runner. And it was a personal account of life in the 1930s or 20s for a good schooner moored in Baja. It was a mothership for, for booze runners. It was, it was a very interesting and, and, and funny story. Um, the next one after that was, um, as we come closer to now, it was by Louis Huff. And <coughs> his book has now been published. Um, the title was called A Fleet to Be Forgotten. And it was a very thorough history of a fleet of wooden vessels built during World War I um, in the cargo handling innovation in these vessels and other vessels, um, and which was a precursor to containerization that came in in the 50s and 60s. And these were big ships that were built in World War I of wood, which was quite unusual, a, a very scholarly book. Um, next in line uh, was <coughs> Piece by Karen Eschen Schuller. And is she here today? No? Okay. Um, and, uh, and it was called Sailing Through Time with the Ships of Eschen and Minor. And it was a manuscript full of colorful details um, on a shipping company that was in her family. And it was, it was, it was a very nice piece. Very, very nice to have. Um, and then the last award 
went to Matt James, and there's Matt here. Hi, Matt. Um, for the account of the voyage of the Skinner Academy in 1906 or thereabouts. And the Skinner Academy was a, a very small wooden schooner um, that was um, purchased by the Academy of Sciences, or related groups as I recall, and taken on a voyage to the Galapagos Islands. And, and, and there were scientists and, a, and a, a relatively small number of crew of the board who did scientific researches um, in the Galapagos, bringing material back to form kind of a core part of the collection of the Academy of Sciences that, as I understand, exists today. And this is in 1906, so you can imagine that the Academy of Sciences, if I recall right, Matt, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, the earthquake hit. And the Academy of Sciences at that time, I believe, was downtown, right? And, and there was a destruction of the collection. And so the schooner brought back a collection of, of natural, what would you call them, specimens, um, that formed you know, a, a, a new seed for the, for the Academy of, of uh, Sciences. Very interesting to you know, compare the way it was done in those days to the way it is done today. Well, you go out and you bag that tortoise and you never know. <laughs> and I don't think that's what we've done in the Galapagos today. Um, that brings us to this award, and I'm very pleased to um, present it to um, uh, Rebecca Hike Ellison. And I don't know if she is here today. Yes. Um, <coughs> oh. <laughs> I probably that. Probably in this size here. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> because um, your father, Harold, uh, and my father were good friends, correspondents, although Harold Hike um, was uh, an unbelievable correspondent. Um, and, uh, and, f and his letters were full of scholarly, scholarly material. Um, and so, the Hyde family lived in Tacoma, Seattle, somewhere up there. Um, and my family lived in San Francisco, and occasionally we would meet. But I'm sure I've met you before, but not for a long time. Not for a long time. Um, so, um, uh, do you go by Rebecca or Becky? Becky. Becky. Mm -hmm. um, you'll have to explain how the manuscript came, came into being and how you sort of got it to this place here, um, because I don't really know that story, but I'll just give a, a little, little glimpse of it. Um, it is written in the first person, or told in the first person, by a sea captain who died at a ripe old age in 1936. And and it's called 40 Years Master. And so you go back to 36, okay, that would be nine, 1896. And then there were many years, and that, no, he, I guess he quit being master in 31, so that would be 1891. And then there were many years when he was not a master. But he was an incredible man, at least by his own health. <laughs> uh, and he lived through many, many um, adventures and events. And, you know, he just recounts them. Well, I was shipwrecked here, I was beached here, I beat the crap out of this guy here, uh, I was uh, charged with murder here, uh, I uh, had to deal with the, you know, Consul General here, um, um, I was dismasted here, I was dismasted there, um, I, you know, had these, uh, the British stole my crew in World War I, uh, um, 
numerous times he recounts how his ship was filling up with water. I mean, it was, to me, I'd be alarmed if there were eight feet of water in the It would seem to be kind of typical for him. He kind of phase it, say, okay, we go and we get the pumps coming as possible. And at one time the deck load washed off and washed off the pumps because there was such a massive wave. And then he was in a real fix at that point. Um, and, but it's just, here is a man who somehow managed, and maybe just through sheer quick thinking, to live through so many what I call catastrophes at sea. And he had the presence of mind to be able to react to them, to take a corrective action so that he lived to a ripe old age. A lot of people wouldn't, didn't. Uh, and maybe that was completely ordinary for a sea captain in those days who had that much experience. I don't know, but I, th I think it was kind of uh, unusual. But his story also gives a very interesting glimpse into, let's say, informal 20, 20, 21st century terms, labor relations. Uh, labor relations were accomplished that way, uh, and if you had if you had a you know a malefactor on board, you had to somehow make that guy work. Um, and so I gather he had kind of a talent for doing that. He managed to get the respect of, of the crew, but also the other people that had dealt with. So anyway, I'm going to stop here and let Becky um, carry on. But I am um, glad to, to, to provide, uh, to present this award to Becky. So why don't you come up if you, if you will. Um, and, uh, and let's get down to business here. <laughs> They, I, I listened to the conversation which was on tape and they had a conversation where she reminisced a little bit about her dad. My father would ask her questions and she presented him with this manuscript which was partially typewritten, partially handwritten and she said, do with it what you can to preserve it. And so he, that was in the summer of, um, or the fall of, I believe, 75, 1975. And over the course of the next year, he worked with Dr. John Lyman from the East Coast, and his name is also very large here. I know that his collection was donated to this library and museum, as was my dad's. And they worked together from both coasts in retranscribing, and do keep in mind this was before even word processors, so this was typewriter work that they were doing. And um, John Lyman actually transcribed the manuscript and 
as, as a small parenthesis right here, I'll say there is one error that I have found. <laughs> the winner of the 1927 Melbourne Cup was not Maria Wallow. That's what the handwriting looks like, but the internet led me to understand it's Tribal. <laughs> so if you read the manuscript, substitute Tribal for Maria Wallow. But you can understand the difficulty of this transcription because handwriting by a man who went to sea when he was in his teens and he didn't spend a lot of time in school was difficult to decipher. So the actual transcription and uh, redoing, the editing of this manuscript was a monumental job. So the transcription happened and then the filling out of detail because Captain Kilman in his reminiscences didn't really put in a lot of the detail as to ship names and departures and arrivals and ports and cargoes and crew names and ship owners. And so because John Lyman and my dad were the researchers that they were, they were very meticulous in tracking down those kinds of details. And so they did a, a tremendous amount of work in verifying all these um, facts. And so over the months uh, through 1976, they typed it out, John Lyman typed it out, they typed out many, many pages of footnotes, and my dad put an article in the Marine Digest, which appeared in April of 1976, hoping that anyone who had memories of, or associations with, or um, any kind of relationship with, or memories of um, Dan Kilman would come forward with those so that they could just add a little more color and fill out the details. And that is actually what scuttled the whole project because um, Captain Kilman's daughter knew Captain Kilman as a father. She didn't really know the details of his life as a man of the sea. And he did have a reputation for, well, he was called Crazy Kilman. And I guess it was a well-earned nickname. And she didn't know that. And she was very reluctant to have anything go in print that would anything but a positive light on her father, and so she wouldn't give written permission for it to be published. So even though um, there was verbal permission, there was no written permission, and Dr. Lyman and my dad wouldn't proceed without that written permission, and so the project got shelved. And then Dr. Lyman died unexpectedly in the fall of 77. The manuscript got put away with my dad always intending to finish it, but as probably everybody in this room knows, good intentions don't always lead to results. Everything else becomes important and too many other things push it out of the way. He intended to finish it. I found a letter even in 2001 where he mentioned this urgency to get it finished in his lifetime. But after he died and when our family was going through his files, just seeing what we had and what would be donated, we came across this manuscript and I just couldn't send it knowing that it was, it truly was 95% ready for publication. And I, I wanted to finish it like I thought my dad would do it himself. And so I, again, I had the advantage of the internet. I went online and I found his grandson-in-law living in Lakewood, Washington, just south of Seattle near Tacoma. Contacted him discovered that um, his wife is no longer able to make decisions regarding anything like this. The, the daughter of Captain Kilman had died, and so he was the one speaking for the family, and he said, do it, great, I'm behind you, I'll help you. And I contacted Mitchell Lyman, the widow of Dr. John Lyman, who's living in North Carolina. She's well into her 90s. She said, yes, please, go ahead and do it. So. The work was largely done. I did retype it. I cleaned up whatever little grammatical missteps there might have been. I contacted a couple of um, uh, the National Maritime Library in Australia and the National the State Library of Australia. And they both sent back information just that quickly about a couple of dates that were missing. And so with that little effort, um, I could get my computer to retranscribe the whole thing plus the notes, and that is what the end result is. So 
honestly, to see something come full circle like this, where the Hike collection is here and the Lyman collection is here and it's in the, the Cordon facility <coughs> that your dad started. I mean, these three men are all behind this work. And to make it even more of a surprise to me, you all are from CMA. My dad attended CMA, graduated from there in 1944. I don't think he could be more delighted. Dave, you would probably know as well as anybody how proud he would be to know that this work finally, <coughs> finally is being completed as it should be. So just to conclude, I will, I will give thanks where they're due. Dave Hall gave me some very helpful advice on how to actually start through this road to finish this up. Gina Barty was just that quick in responding. I had a couple of email requests and she came back very quickly. Frederick Hokanson, who is Dan Kilman's grandson-in-law, was very helpful and actually provided me with some family photos that my dad and um, Dr. Lyman didn't have. And, um, Mitchell Lyman, as I said, he was back in North Carolina. And I couldn't remember the two names in Australia. Paul D. and Julian Simpson helped me. And my husband Drew, who found stuff in the freezer when I wouldn't get up and fix any meals because I was so busy <laughs> typing. So thank you, the committee, for this award. And I do thank you, Dave, for your help and Gina. And I'm I'm, I'm delighted that um, the end is finally in sight for this story that was written in the 30s, but actually began in 1860 at the birth of Dan Kilman. Thank you. Um, 